When I returned from Vietnam, I was hanging out at my dad's house, and he told me to come out here and work in the fields because he didn't want bums hanging out at his house. So I said, okay. Uh, I came out for a few weeks before I started uh, college. And one day, these candy-ass Border Patrol guys come around, and they asked me, hey, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm working. What do you think? They said, oh, yeah? Well, where are your, uh, where are your papers? And I said, papers? Here are your papers, hijos de la chingada. American because they wanted to come out here and work in the cotton fields. They call us uh, Mexicans. As soon as there's a war, all of a sudden we're American. What am I doing? Picking cotton and fruits all over the place, all over the state, living under trees chicken coops, barns, wherever, no school, no education, just work, work, work. My mother actually used to pick cotton and instead of child care, she would drag us on her cotton sack. We actually would start working when we were about six or seven years old. The economy was booming here in Corcoran. The cotton was going full blast. And they all came here for the, the dream that you know, money is readily available here. It's a farm labor town. Uh, it always has been. Uh, and in those days that we were growing up, we were still picking cotton by hand. So we did a lot of cotton picking and they were getting uh, cotton, planting cotton, chopping cotton, weeding cotton. Picking cotton, chopping cotton, irrigating. We were like a new tribe here. And everyone knew everybody, and everybody worked out in the fields. And it was uh, very different than it is now. We used to live in the farm labor camps. If you were going to live in their camp, you had to work for them. And we lived in Ryan Camps, which was part of J.G. Boswell company. I felt that there was something better in life for, for myself. I had heard about Vietnam. I didn't know what Vietnam was all about. All I knew is there was guys going over there. Here in Corkin, I've counted at least 100 Vietnam veterans, Chicano Vietnam veterans. I joined the service because my country called for it, and I was proud to be an American, and I was proud to be an athlete. I was proud. I wanted for my family to be proud of me. My dad was a World War II veteran, my uncle Sam was a World War II veteran, and my uncle Alfredo fought in Korea. And I also wanted to be a hero. I wanted to watch like those war movies. I said, yeah, I want to be one of those guys. So for about three nights, he came a little drunk about two, three o'clock in the morning. About the fifth, fourth night, fourth day, I told him, hey, you're only 18. You shouldn't be drinking that much. My dad says, you know, uh, this is my house. Uh, you know, you got to do what I say. Hey, I'm a man already. I can do what I want. And so I said, well, you know what? I'm going to go to the Army. I, I don't have to take this crap, you know. I'm going to join the Army. So you won't, I, I won't bother you, and you won't bother me. I said, OK, it's up to you. But if you join the Army, you think I'm mean. I said, you, you're going to find out something bad. I found out that they tell you more in the Army of what to do. At the time, they not only used to cuss us out, but they used to hit us. 
they will make us do all kinds of crazy things. They were extremely hard and, and there was no reason for it. I remember the first day we were here, we came off the bus and right away those guys started yelling at us. And I volunteered for the Army in that, in contrast to the draftees, the, the people who were drafted, I mean, they used to laugh at us. Because, what are you doing in this Army? You actually volunteered? And I said, oh, hell, what the heck did I get myself into? I knew I made a mistake right there and then. My dad certainly told me not to go. The reason he told me not to go is because he said I wouldn't like it. And he was 100% correct. I hated the military, and I still do. They tried to uh, take your identity away uh, for, in order to, for you to become a soldier and uh, literally a uh, killing machine. I've seen so many movies where a Mexicano or a Puerto Rican in a war zone with a crucifix on his knees crying instead of fighting the battle. But that wasn't true. If we were like worked out in the fields and we were kind of like tough, okay, so we, we didn't take it as hard being in the infantry. There were so many of us there, and most of us were put in combat positions, infantry, artillery, and so forth. The Mexicanos and the Puerto Ricans walked point war, and they did a lot of other things where you had to sacrifice something, either walking the point or carrying a gun or, or, um, or going out on night ambushes. We tend to be macho, you know, the word macho is the Mexican word. And so there's a lot of machismo in the Mexicanos, the soldados. And so it comes out in that, you know, we do some dumb things sometimes. We take extra, extra risk that somebody won't take. When the bullets start flying, you come out of a chopper, man, and guys drop, you know? You're running and you don't really know where you're running to. You're just following everybody else. You have no idea of what you're supposed to do, you know? I figured um, I'll get the help. I'm in the Marine Corps, man. My fellow guys will help me. You know, they're gonna teach me things. They're gonna show me things. It wasn't like that at all. No one wants to talk to you. No one wants anything to do, to do with you because you're a FNG, fucking new guy. Believe it or not, there's, there's a certain way that you walk in the jungle and a uh, certain way you put your foot down, and, and I didn't know that. I was walking like if I was walking down the fields here, here in Corcoran. I'm my first firefight, man. I didn't fire around. Bullets flying all the way. I figured they don't know where I'm at, and they're gonna shoot at me. I went to the bush. Um, Um, <clears throat> they're getting worse and worse, and um, I remember dropping my first guy, you know. I remember seeing it, and um, I was brought up a Catholic, and I didn't, um, I didn't think it was right. Reality hit really hard, you know. Down the line, yeah, it changed, you know, it changed a lot, you know, things happen. I've seen guys do some real stupid things, you know. Guys have dead, man, they're kicking heads, popping their eyes out, poking their eyes out, you know. Carving bodies, you know, I couldn't do that. When I was a 60 gunner, I used to take the front side blade, which was in a point, it was in a triangle like that, and the, and the, the edge was real sharp on, the, on, on that. And I used to stick that anywhere I could. And it was just sure madness uh, because I was angry. I used to see what they used to do to our soldiers. 
um, I was not only angry, but I was, uh, I was a killer. When I killed someone, I felt like I was completely elated. I was completely felt powerful. Like you have the power of God in you to take someone's life. But at the same time, it was so frightening that after you start thinking about it, that I didn't like the feeling. There was a, a guy that, well, he's got two grenades. So he reaches for the grenades. When he reaches for the grenades, everybody opens up. Everybody opens up. And they shot that guy about 200 times. And he's laying there, and where his, where his ear used to be, his brain's hanging out. We took that stuff so casual that it was so common that the other guy started messing around. They, one of them grabbed him and threw him at, at me. And I remember his brains went all over my boots. His brains all over the boots. You know, we all busted out laughing. Everybody busted out laughing. You know, I was like the joke was on me. You know, I got the brains on me. But I thought to myself, what's wrong here? What's, what's happened to me? I got wounded. I got wounded exactly a month after I got there. That's when I, I realized, you know, I wasn't invincible. And that it, it wasn't no longer the cause to defend our country or for the flag. It was to, you know, save my butt from then on. By this time, almost all the platoon was new because of casualties and the other guys had gone home. And we brought in a new lieutenant. And he was a okay lieutenant. He was a nice guy, but he wasn't the best type of personality that you want. Because um, he had just had dropped out of a seminary. So, uh, you know, he, he was a really nice guy, but you really don't want a priest to, to be leading you unless he's a real mean one. They said, now you guys pack up, you're gonna go help a company that got ambushed really badly. And I said, oh no, today's my day. And yeah, we ran into the enemy. So I shot down, and as I shot down the grenade launcher, I got hit with some shrapnel. I don't know if it was my shrapnel or some other shrapnel, but I got hit with shrapnel right on top of my eyelid, bullseye. Can you imagine someone getting a hot ice pick and putting it in your eye, right? And then moving it a little bit, oh shit, man. And so uh, I went down and then I didn't feel my body anymore. All I could do was think. I started thinking about God and I prayed to God and I said, God, if you let me live, I promise I'll pick cotton the rest of my life. And, and I saw myself picking cotton. Being from a, a, a rural area, after a while, I started thinking, I said, what are we doing out here? Uh, when I started identifying with the Vietnamese people, I have certain physical characteristics that are very similar. Uh, they would come up and put their arm, and they would compare arms, and they'd say, same, 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 Vietnamese, same, same. It seems as though they took our farm workers to go fight their farm workers. Uh, and we would kill their pigs and their burn their houses. And I said, wow, what am I doing burning this guy's house, man? Uh, they're not going to attack Corcoran. I said, what are we doing out here? And we're all going to lose. And we all did lose. He told me, I said, no. He said, yes. I said, no. He said, yes. I said, no, he's not dead. He said, yes. So. They were very courteous with us. There was a soldier that took him from Oakland all the way to Texas, and the guards were besides his casket, you know, and they would um, take turns, you know, two at a time, 15 minutes, and until the whole thing was finished. I could see those poor kids, you know, some of them, their tears will just roll down because they probably didn't know what could happen to them. 
See, I had uh, uncles in the Second War, and I seen how people treated them with a lot of respect. But when these kids came from Vietnam, it was a horrible thing. And I said, well, maybe it was better. Maybe it was better that he didn't come home because I don't think I could have taken it if I had seen him in a condition like I've seen a lot of these Vietnam kids. It's really, really hard for a mother to see their own son go away and, and fight for this country. And then they come home for what? <laughs> When I first landed in, in San Francisco, coming from the jungle is a, is a real awful feeling. When we encountered the protesters, of course they had tomatoes and all kinds of stuff, so they started throwing them at us and calling us uh, murderers and child killers. And what went through my mind in, in that moment was, where's my weapon? Where's my rounds? Where's my grenades? We were taught to be very violent people. And it's very difficult to turn on that conditioning just like that, just because you come home. Because we were violent, very violent. <laughs> I was so programmed to kill. You give a guy a gun, and then you take that gun away from him, bring him home, and everything's supposed to be okay. It's not. When I got discharged, I didn't put my uniform on, I left it tied up, I got discharged in civilian clothes, you know, because I didn't want to put the uniform on, I didn't want to come home in uniform. I had nothing to be proud about. It's not easy to come home, man, and you got all this guilt inside of you, you got all this hatred inside of you, you got all this pain inside of you, and your parents are seeing you, you know, you think they can see right through you because they knew you. They changed your diapers. When he came home, he was crazy, like he did something wrong and he can fix it. He get up at night, when the heck is Charlie? He'll be out there in the street just walking back and forth. And you get things like startled response when you hear things and you jump. Uh, your whole uh, chemical system in your body is changed. Coming from eating sea rations to eating tortillas, beans, papas, and all kinds of good food, I couldn't. I couldn't handle that food. I couldn't sleep. Every time I'd go to sleep, I'd wake up with, with nightmares. It got so serious, I was fearful for my children's life. Because he would just sit up in bed, and then he would just be so quiet, and he'd crawl on the floor. And he would crawl, and he would say, Charlie's coming, and he would just lay there and not move. And I knew if I breathed too hard, it was, <laughs> I was a goner. This is 30 years ago when he's still coming out of it. It takes a long time. Yeah. But look, look at him if you want, playing with the kids. He was never there for the family. And this is a completely different person. When he was with his friends, there was a different side of him. Those veteranos, they all drank, they shared stories. Everything was hunky-dory with them. But when he was with us, it was a whole different a whole different situation. The counselor, she started telling me how they have to desensitize the, the soldiers when they go over there. She says they program them to deal with what's going on, but no one deprograms them. So guess who has to do it? It's your job to do it. When you're in Vietnam, your body's working on adrenaline, and then coming home and then having nothing to do. Actually, I wanted to go back to Vietnam. But the day that I came back, I didn't like the United States. I didn't belong. People had changed too much. I didn't really realize that I was the one that had changed. I didn't feel that anybody could understand what I went through. I didn't want to talk to anybody. Not even the Vietnam veterans. I didn't want to talk to them. So what I used to do instead is I used to get in the car by myself, buy myself a case of beer and four packs of cigarette and go out and drink by myself. That's all I did. Inside, it hurts because you feel like you're an outcast. 
you feel different, you act different, but you don't know, you don't see yourself. I was a correctional officer, you know, I'd been about 10 years. You know, I worked the yards, I worked the buildings. So I saw a lot of violence. I saw guys get stabbed, you know, shot, raped, you know. It didn't bother me, you know, pieces of metal stick inside a guy and you're holding him up, you know, and you can't pull it out. You know, but you know, I've seen guys just pass out just from looking at that. To me, it didn't bother me. I was good at it because I could handle it. I enjoyed it, man, to tell you the truth. I like the quick decisions. I like the quick reactions, the adrenaline pumping, the, um, the excitement of it. You know, I got a kick out of it. I liked it. It brought me back to Vietnam. It was a very difficult time. But the, what really helped me was uh, my family, my mother in particular, uh, supporting me, but not talking about it, but just being there, you know, and helping you out. And I had goals, and in my family we have, a, as in many Chicano families, we have a really strong work ethic, especially being farm workers. So that also helped me in that I just wasn't laying around, you know, I would work. But I know I didn't want to work in the fields, so I wanted to go to college. So college was a, a way uh, for me to do certain things. Except I couldn't take college seriously either. Good morning, students. Got to be here in Corcoran High School. It's been a long time since I've been here. Uh, I graduated here in 1968. That's a long time ago, huh? You were in firefights and people getting killed, and I was the sergeant, and I was making certain decisions that were important, life or death sometimes, and, staying, and keeping my butt alive too. And so those are very important things and very immediate things. So when somebody comes over here and tells you, you better get an A, or, you know, you better do your test, or you better study, or I'm going to give you an F. I mean, okay, well, well I'm scared, man. <laughs> Today I'm here to talk about the Vietnam War began about, what, 1964. We didn't think much about a war going on. You know, they say there's a war. Then, all of a sudden, if you graduate in June, then by January, you could be out in the middle of the jungle in Vietnam. You say, wow, this is a big difference from Corcoran High School. It's hard now thinking back about all the things that we did and saw. It's hard to imagine, you know, somebody at 19 doing that and I really wouldn't like my son or anybody else that I know to go through that. I've seen what happens, and there's nothing glorious about war. I think we should still have the draft. And I think every young man should go in the military and serve. It helps uh, to learn discipline and to learn teamwork and to learn how to uh, survive on your own. Because here, sitting at home with mom and dad uh, doesn't help them. I didn't think it was a very good idea to go around killing people. You know, I had to do it. However, I did feel really bad about the, their family, their mothers and fathers, their brothers and sisters. Killing somebody is not the hard part. The hard part, man, is learning to live what you did. If you realize that you only went there to do a job, and if you learn to forgive yourself and ask the man to forgive you, everything will come out all right. Ask for forgiveness and it'll come.